I do remember Palm Sunday. Everywhere I ever went, we did Palm Sunday. I'll tell you what was weird for me, though. Um, we never did Ash Wednesday, never did Holy Week proper, right? But we did Palm Sunday, and we got full-on palms, right? Like, you got the palm with, like, all the fronds going out the side of it. And when I walked into my first Catholic mm-hmm. church and they handed me a palm for all, Palm Sunday, and it's, like, one little strand, I'm like, this is it? Is it, is it where's, where's the rest of the Where's the rest of the palm? So that was an adjustment for me, I got to say. That was a little culture shock moment the first time I got a single frond instead of a whole branch. <laughs> What's that irony of, of celebrating a, uh, a Palm Sunday in the midst of Lent? So we have to celebrate on the one hand, but we also have to keep it penitential. So you only get one, one small frond. Hello and welcome back to Deep in Christ. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi, here at the Coming Home Network International, where we're all on journeys. We're all on a journey deeper every day with our Lord Jesus Christ. And for many of us, that brought us home to the Catholic Church, uh, or for many people in the network, uh, they're thinking about becoming Catholic, they're asking those questions. Um, but wherever you are on that journey, wherever you are in relationship to the Church, your theological background, where you're coming from. The point is our daily task remains the same, is to stay close to Jesus Christ, to keep walking that journey with him, and that's what we're doing here on the show. That's what we're talking about. I'm joined today by my good friends and colleagues, Ken Hensley and Matt Swaim. And guys, uh, it's good to be here with you again. Good to see you guys across the across the interwaves here. I'm going to have you reintroduce yourself, <laughs> your familiar faces, obviously, around here at the Coming Home Network, but for ever whoever happens to be watching or listening... What do you do around here at the Coming Home Network, starting with you, Ken? Well, um, I am the director of pastoral care uh, for the Coming Home Network. And uh, what that essentially means is that I focus on um, the ways that we can provide pastoral care to all the people that come to us. We, we have a lot of people who come, laymen, laywomen, a lot of Protestant pastors who are at some stage along the journey, either they become barely curious about the Catholic faith and they're beginning to look into it or they're halfway along or they come to us just fully, you know, um, fully convinced that the Catholic church is Christ's church and wanting to know what do I do? So the focus of my ministry is with them primarily. So I handle uh, Protestant pastors that come to us from really from every denomination under the sun and scattered all around the world. I mean, just this morning I had a zoom conferences with one, um, Anglican from Dubai, and then I had a conference with a Lutheran pastor from the Bay Area. So they're scattered all over. Anyway, that's mainly what I do here. And awesome. uh, you did tell them my name. My name's Ken. Ken Hensley. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Thanks, Ken. Matt. Yeah. So as director of outreach, um, I'm Matt Swaim. First of all, uh, and I just want to say how grateful I am that you use the word journey and on journeys, you know, in the course of the introduction of this, because this is deep uh, part of what I do journey with Matt and Ken. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. So uh, part of what I do yeah. is, is help, uh, you know, coordinate all the content from our various places that, uh, that it comes from, including on the journey with Matt and Ken, uh, including things like yeah. deep in Christ and, and the journey home and our written story content. And you know, kind of try and figure out there's a whole bunch of different team members who are doing all kinds of amazing things and putting together pieces of content, uh, including people that you don't even see on some of these, right? Like the invisible guy, Seth, who's like cutting this all together. Like there's a great team of people doing all sorts of things. And so I'm, uh, you know, in charge of trying to make sure that all those pieces fit together and, and make sense and especially make sense in the context of what Ken's doing uh, with pastoral care so that everything we're doing kind of speaks to the needs of people who are trying to figure out, you know, is my home in the church. And uh, even for people who have come yeah. home to the church, right? You know, there's still kind of that question about like, all right, where do I fit now? So so all of it's at the service of that. And it's a, honestly, it's it's fun. There's the, Ken's in the middle of the stories and then I get to tell the finished product a lot of times and it's great. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you guys. Yeah, and then it's good thank to have, you, gentlemen, it, for... it's good to have, it, it's good to have Seth as invisible as you said. I've heard about certain saints that had a gift of invisibility and that's why Seth was hired is because he has that gift and he's able to be invisible and do the editing and so forth. Now, he's been on a previous episode here, so that we've already ruined the invisibility oh, no. thing. But we've maybe, maybe ruined the myth. Since then. Well, Gentlemen, he thanks for joining today. Uh, we're on a particular <laughs> journey. We've been t- talking about the journey here that, that 
that journey into the Catholic Church or of exploring the Catholic Church. Uh, we're on a micro journey today uh, here in the midst of this conversation. We're just near the end of the Lenten journey, and we're nearing uh, Easter Sunday. We are in the midst of Holy Week. And our thought today, I want to invite you guys on here to, to talk a little bit about Holy Week mm-hmm. and actually to talk a little bit about Lent as well. I want, I want to look at this whole annual journey that we're invited to go on by the church, this uh, penitential journey through Lent into Holy Week where we commemorate uh, the events of the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, his passion and death, uh, culminating in the Easter resurrection. Uh, I want to talk a bit about that today. I wanted you guys to reflect a little bit on how you celebrated, how you uh, participated in this spiritual discipline of this of this time uh, from your particular backgrounds in your stories and how that looks uh, similar or different as a Catholic. And then my hope would be that we can you know, share some words of encouragement to others who are going through this particular, again, this, this year's spiritual discipline of Lent, Holy Week, and Easter. And so, Ken, why don't we begin with you? What, did, what if anything, did Lent sure. and Holy Week uh, and Easter look like uh, from your particular background? Well, it, it, it's probably good that you begin with me because, because in, in terms of Protestant denominations, I come from the almost the far end away from Catholicism. Um, being a Baptist pastor, which, is, which in Southern California was pretty much the equivalent of being a non-denominational evangelical church, but organized in a denomination. Um, <clears throat> Matt was uh, from a Methodist and Nazarene, kind of a holiness background, so a little bit more liturgical, really. And so anyway, uh, all that to say that I'm thinking back, and I even asked my wife a little while ago, I said, did we do anything on Palm Sunday? Did we give out palms? And she said, I can't remember. <laughs> and <laughs> I can't remember either. I can't remember either. But to put it you know, in simple terms, we did not have Lent. That wasn't something we knew about. And we did not really have Holy Week. Um, what I remember is the celebration of Easter Sunday, which we called Resurrection Sunday. We didn't want to call it Easter because that's too close to Ishtar, which is too close to paganism, which the Roman Catholic Church brought into the Christian world, you know, the whore of Babylon and all that. And so we called it Resurrection Sunday, and we celebrated the resurrection of Christ and I don't really remember if the week before that we celebrated Palm Sunday. I'm sure I preached on Palm Sunday, but I'm not sure if there was anything more than that. But there definitely wasn't Lent. Okay, and so something about the differences and the not-so-difference. In, sure. in a deep way, there's not a tremendous difference for me now. And what I mean by that is that the things that are essential to the Catholic celebration of Lent and, and Holy Week, that is repentance toward God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, wanting to grow deeper, and then wanting to celebrate his passion. Well, these things were present in my Baptist church. These were present in the evangelical world. And what that reminds me of is a passage from the Catechism that I probably share with the people I work with more often than any other passage. And that is um, paragraphs 818 and 819, I believe which basically say, it's talking about the Reformation, and it's, it's talking about how the tremendous divide that occurred at the time of the Reformation was a terrible sorrow. And, and it says, and there was undoubtedly sin on both sides in what happened. And then the catechism, our Catholic catechism goes on to say, but we do not hold accountable those who are raised in, these, in the separated communities that resulted from the Reformation. They're raised in the faith of Christ, and we receive them with respect and affection as brothers. And then it goes on in the next paragraph to say, um, and we view, or the Holy Spirit uses these communities as means of salvation because they have the Word of God, and they have love for Christ, and faith in, faith in the triune God and the Holy Spirit. So, in a sense, I look back on that time and I realize Everything that I have now, I mean, not everything entirely, but most of what I have now, I had then, you know, yeah. but becoming Catholic, it's, it, it provides this, this much more formalized structure, which is so healthy. I mean, you know, like a, I mean, imagine if you had weddings without any formal structure, you know, or, or you know, funerals without any formal structure whatsoever. Well, right. w- what this does is it provides a formalization of it. And so, um, I, I, I'll say more later. I don't want to say everything at once, but just for instance, Ash Wednesday. To go to Mass on Ash Wednesday 
and to walk forward and to hear those words, dust thou art and to dust thou shalt return, and then to receive the ashes on my forehead as a formal beginning of this period of mortification and prayer and sacrifice and all that is just so helpful to a simple human being walking around with bones and flesh and, and skin. Um, it's, it's helpful and it's, it's more helpful than just saying, Hey, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be Easter, you know, a couple of months from now, start getting ready. We often make that connection, right? That uh, we never look back at our Protestant backgrounds with anything but gratitude uh, to those who shared Christ with us, as well as what the Holy Spirit's doing in those communities. Mm -hmm. And we always want to make that connection over and over again, because uh, again, our message to those who are on the journey, and many members of the Coming Home Network right now who are considering whether to become Catholic, we want them to know that Number one, we're, we're walking with them on the journey, and our, our greatest concern here is that they continue to follow Jesus, you know, that they don't need to jump to conclusions. They need to stay close to Jesus. We also want them to know about our journeys, that where this has resulted with us in the Catholic Church is that now we're still with Jesus. Like, that's that's the thread here. Uh, we believe mm -hmm. that this is the fullness, that there's more that Christ wants to give them, but that's the thread, that we're still following Christ, mm -hmm. and that the, the seasons, the liturgical seasons— and all the stuff, the smells and the bells, it's only important, it's only helpful because it's part of this uh, participating in the in the in our Christian faith and growing closer yeah. to Christ. Matt, why don't you give us a sense of uh, how that looked from your particular background? Yeah, so Ken uh, sort of spilled the beans on me. You know, he and his Baptists out in California, you know, are doing their thing uh, with the Jesus movement and the the hippie conversions. Uh, me, I'm in the Bible Belt, right? Uh, you know, so. Um, <laughs> And, you know, my family, uh, you know, with roots on East and West Tennessee and, uh, you know, the churches I grew up in, Wesleyan Holiness, uh, I was in, uh, the most vivid memories for me are from uh, when I was at a church of the Nazarene. And again, this is, uh, you know, sprung out of kind of a holiness revivalist type of movement. So, uh, you know, Wesleyan roots in a lot of ways, and Wesley came from the Anglicans. And so we hadn't jettisoned all those things. We had actually kept a fair amount of... Um, at least the theological parts of that. And, you know, I remember uh, going to Maundy Thursday services, right? Uh, and, you know, you'll hear kind of in the English patrimony sometimes those Holy Thursday services are, are referred to Maundy Thursday because Jesus says a new command I give you, right? Maundy is kind of like from that that root. And you do kind of a, a reenactment of of the Last Supper, uh, as it were. And I remember that. But in, the, in my Nazarene church, I remember very specifically that we had an Easter cantata that we did every year. And we had, I don't know, like 400 or so people on a Sunday morning. And mm -hmm. when the Easter cantata rolled around, it's this whole church play that probably like 80 people are involved in. <laughs> so like from the set design, like the youth group's like setting up and tearing down like, you know, set pieces. You got uh, Gary, the local guy who runs his own contracting business, plays Jesus every year. This other guy, Randy, is always the the good thief, right? You're like, there's there's like certain people who play mm -hmm. these roles. I even remember like if somebody were to like start into one of the songs from the cantata, I would be able to like pick up right now and sing the lyrics to it. And I remember, um, you know, we would sell so we would give out free tickets to this thing, and we'd do like seven performances over the course of you know from. I mean, it may have been from you know, Thursday through Sunday that we would do these performances and they would just be packed with people from the mm -hmm. community. And what's interesting looking back on that is that it all began with the story of Adam in the garden, right? And like the first song is kind of like God looking for Adam, like, Adam, where are you? Um, and when I came into the church and you go to the Easter vigil, right? What do you hear? But you hear kind of like you walk in, all the lights are dim, right? Everything's out. People have candles. You get the exultet, you know, sort of like the the opening salvo of what's about to happen. And then you get salvation history. We all sit and we hear salvation history, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it culminates in, in the baptism of new people into the church and the reception of people, uh, you know, coming in. And so in some ways, you know, I was kind of, I kind of learned to put the pieces of salvation history together in that context, with the cross. The cross was never just this thing that happened over here because I was bad. It's part of this larger context of 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 God trying to get us back after we broke everything in the Garden of Eden. So um, that's a very vivid memory for me. You mentioned Palm Sunday. 
I do remember Palm Sunday. Everywhere I ever went, we did Palm Sunday. I'll tell you what was weird for me, though. Um, we never did Ash Wednesday, never did Holy Week proper, right? We did Palm Sunday, and we got full-on palms, right? Like, you got the palm with, like, all the fronds going out the side of it. And when I walked into my first Catholic mm-hmm. church, and they handed me a palm for all, Palm Sunday, and it's, like, one little strand, I'm like, this is it? Is it, is it where's, where's the rest of the Where's the rest of the palm? <laughs> So that was an adjustment for me, I got to say. That was a little culture shock moment the first time I got a single frond instead of a whole branch. <laughs> What's that irony of, of celebrating a, uh, a Palm Sunday in the midst of Lent? So we have to celebrate on the one hand, but we also have to keep it penitential. So you only get one one small frond. Yeah, yeah and with that, this, <laughs> so this is a... This is the thing, too, that, like, was really weird for me was, you know, on Palm Sunday, we hear the Passion uh-huh. in the Catholic mm-hmm. liturgy. Like, I'm like, mm-hmm. and wherever I was, you know, growing up, Palm Sunday, it's all celebration. We don't do the Passion stuff until right. until the end, right? And so, and then, of course, sunrise well, services was a big part, too. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. You know, so one thing that characterizes, I think, a lot of the Lenten and Holy Week tradition as a Catholic is sort of, a, we could call it Lexio Divina, this placing ourselves in the gospel story. Uh, and so with, mm-hmm. on Palm Sunday, all the services throughout Holy Week and Good Friday and Holy Saturday, there's this placing ourselves uh, in the story of the Passion, both by the readings that occur, but also a, a, by the the form of the, the liturgy that occurs. It's We're trying to place ourselves. I mean, that that in some sense, it's, I mean, that on the one hand, the biblical side of that is, is something that I would think many Protestants would be very connected with. On the other side, the very the sacramental side of it, the smells and the bells and the fronds and the holy water, mm-hmm. and that that's obviously uh, something that many may be a little uncomfortable with. It's maybe a little different from their particular tradition. Yeah, that's yeah, for sure. I, you know, I, I as I began to study the Catholic faith, and I began to be drawn toward it, and I started to learn more about it. I can see that I began to bend my Baptist church in kind of a Catholic direction just sort of halfway. Like, for instance, I suggested that we begin to celebrate the the Lord's Supper every Sunday, which was just a radical thing because in many Protestant churches, the Lord's Supper is only celebrated once a quarter or once a month. In our church, it was once a month, but I suggested we move to once a week. And yet even then, I remember I'd be standing at the table and I'd be saying the words, you know, of consecration and kind of thinking to myself, wow, this is weird though, because I'm not a priest. And this, you know, this is when I was basically, uh, you know, intellectually being converted to the Catholic faith. But uh, because of that, I, I instituted a Good Friday service at one point, and I just sort of created it for, uh, from scratch. And what it was, was a time in which I assigned readings to a bunch of people in the church, and we would read the entire passion narrative that, that in the Catholic church is read out loud on Palm Sunday morning. Um, people would stand up and read the entire passion narrative and I'd have a bunch of songs interspersed between, you know, hymns and songs that I would lead on the guitar and, um, you know, all songs about the passion of, of Christ and people found it very meaningful. So that was me kind of moving things in that direction. You know, what's yeah. interesting, Ken, is when you, when you, when you mentioned that songs about the passion, uh, there's a, I think there's a, there's a piece of theological, <clears throat> It's a distinction without a difference in some ways. Uh, you know, the, the concept that some Catholics are like, you know, mm-hmm. they believe that certain Protestants don't believe in having Jesus's body on the cross, right? Because we celebrate a resurrected Lord, um, not merely a crucified Lord. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's true. I don't, I didn't grow up with crucifixes anywhere, <clears throat> but you know, I grew up with, there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's <laughs> veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood, you know, Lose all their guilty stains, and what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. We sing about the cross and the blood of Christ like all the time, constantly, all the time. And so, you know, I, I think that that's one of those those things. We 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 had it as a mental picture in our in our heads in, mm-hmm. in my Christian tradition, and uh, you know, and even in the case of the cantata, we saw it kind of depicted by you know, Gary, the contractor up there on the cross, right? As Jesus, and that, you know, putting yourself in the story. Um, but Catholicism takes all that and it takes it to like this next level. Like when you're in Holy Week, like you're walking with the whole church around the world through these events. Uh, I mean, we, we've been talking about Holy Thursday and Good Friday 
and Holy Saturday and Easter Sunday. We, we haven't even talked about Spy Wednesday. Like, that's on the calendar, right? <laughs> we got a day on the calendar that commemorates when Judas betrays Jesus. Like, we go, we go into the, the, the nitty gritty. I mean, it's, it is really a walking with Christ to his passion in a way that's a lot more vivid than I ever experienced, even though I did experience it quite vividly. And I'm very grateful for the ways that I experienced it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me spring off that with something because, uh, b- back to what I said at the beginning, I, I recognize looking back that in my evangelical past, all of the essentials were there. I mean, apart from sacrament, the sac- the actual sacraments, but all of the essentials were there in the sense that I believed in repentance and I believed in penance and I believed in prayer and I believed in preparing my heart for, you know, the, the, for resurrection Sunday and celebrating the resurrection where Christ rises from the dead and brings life to the world. All those essentials were there, but I find it so helpful how in the Catholic tradition, we we are given all these props, you know, we're, we're given all these formal props and prompts to help us. One of the things that really, th- this is something I've, I've not heard anybody else talk about, but one of the many, many things that led me in the direction of Catholicism was the fact that in Catholicism, things that may appear just in seed form in the New Testament are, are actually fleshed out and they, they grow with an organic growth and become something real. And the illustration I always give is the life of celibacy. Anybody reading the New Testament can see that there are the seeds of this idea that there are some people that will choose to um, to commit themselves to a life of celibacy for the kingdom of God. St. Paul talks about it. Our Lord talks about it. The seeds are there. And yet, if anyone, if any young man had ever stood up in my church at the end of a Sunday morning service and said, I hereby commit myself to a life of celibacy for the kingdom of God. See, I'm laughing yeah, hey, because everybody would have... Good job, weirdo. Yeah. Uh, and what do you want? You want the whole church to start paying for all your bills right now? Is that what you're at? What? Yeah. Come on, man. Everybody would... See, even though it's there in the New Testament, everybody would have just thought this guy's weird. And and he's and he would be weird to a great extent. He would be weird because there's no structure for it. There's no structure for it within the Baptist church or within evangelical world. So he's just kind of launching out on his own. And yeah, you're right, Matt. It'd be like, so now I suppose you want us to pay for you. So, um, and yet within- Yes, I've taken a vow of poverty too. Uh, I'm sure you guys can help me with that. (laughs) Right. Yeah, I mean- But but within Catholicism, all the way back to St. Anthony of the Desert, you have this whole thing growing, the monastic, you know, convents or women and monks, and you have this whole thing forming and then celibacy within the priesthood as well uh, so so that someone who decides to do that now has has a brotherhood has, has a sisterhood has a whole framework in which to do it and i'm applying that to to holy to lent and and holy week because when i receive the ashes again and and i heard that call i'm not doing it alone i you know every catholic in the whole world is doing it and they're all thinking about what am I going to sacrifice for Lent, and they're all making their decisions and all that. And then they're all praying that they'll be able to stick with the with the promise that they make. They, there's a whole thing we're doing together. And then when Holy Week comes, everybody has got the palms. And you know, Monday, Thursday, everybody is watching the foot. You know, you know, it's something we do together, and that that's something God gives us because we're weak human beings and we need all the help we can get. I'll just leave it at that for now, but. John Mark, what do you think? You're sitting there watching us old Protestants. Well, fly yeah. Off the so I got a bunch of things. Number one, like uh, I, I really enjoy Holy Week to all the props, right? Especially now that I have a bunch of kids. Certainly, I, mm-hmm. I can sit and read and meditate on the scriptures, and we of course try to encourage the kids to do that too. But the props are pretty helpful to them. You know, the crucifixes and the different liturgies corresponding to different aspects of the Passion. Mm-hmm. Uh, on Friday, for instance, on Good Friday, we always. <clears throat> We fast a good portion of the day, and we we try to invoke sort of a time of, of just silence, which is tough with a bunch of little kids who don't ever be silent ever, you know. But we try to have a time where we're fasting, and we're being quiet, and we and we listen to a bit of the passion narrative and some hymns uh, interspersed with just silence. And so it may be the one mm-hmm. day in the year where all the kids just sit still on chairs, you know, for extended length of time, uh, interspersed. But again, it's it's that that particular practice, the form of it, the props, but also the fact that it's done year after year. Because then even the the liturgies in the church, but as well as our own family liturgical aspects of that, every year it's the same thing. And there's a little bit of, of going deeper in that every year. 
I wanted to ask you, you, you brought up the fasting there, Ken. So I want to back up from Holy Week a little bit. Talk a little bit about the spiritual ascetic disciplines. You know, was that, was that a part of your faith? And how have you found, how do you find that uh, as an aid to you in this recurring time of, of, of a, a penitential returning to Christ in this passion? Okay. Well, uh, I'll try to run through this without going on too long. But at the beginning of my Christian life, I, I came to faith in Jesus in a totally non-denominational, non-liturgical in every way, a complete sola scriptura framework. You you open the Bible, you read it, you decide what it's teaching. Very, very simple. And so I never heard of the spiritual disciplines for a while. Of course, in Bible college and seminary, I'm beginning to learn about these things. But a, a book came out in the early 80s called Celebration of Discipline that was written by a, an evangelical author named Richard Foster. And what they were, it was a book about the spirit, the classic spiritual disciplines. So there would be a chapter on meditation, a chapter on prayer, a chapter on fasting, a chapter on the discipline of silence, you just referred to, the discipline of solitude. And right. I was becoming exposed in a serious way through reading that book. And it, it, it kind of became a cult classic among many evangelicals at the time. And I think I read it a couple times and it was all highlighted and marked up and all that. And so... I was learning about these various disciplines and understanding the role that they would have in, in helping me to grow in my walk with the Lord. Um, and I also was noticing how Catholic they were, because in this book, even though it was written for evangelicals, he was just quoting constantly from St. You know, Catherine of Siena, St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross. In fact, he was mainly quoting from Catholics. And so I, I, I could see looking back later that this was, ah, here, here's another way in which Catholicism was kind of com coming into my life. And so the spiritual disciplines are important. And to talk about this, though, you know, I am such a easily distractible person that I, that I struggle. I'm like, I might be like your kids, you know, you know trying, trying to get them to be, to be quiet. Maybe not Ken, that bad. Ken, sit still. But, <laughs> <laughs> Ken, Kid, shut up. But but I struggle with the disciplines, but the spiritual disciplines, yeah, are these are means by which Jesus can form us and form us into the image of Christ. And so I'm not, not sure I'm remembering the last part of your question, except that they definitely have a part in my life. And I, I practice spiritual disciplines every, every day of my life. And, oh, yeah. you mentioned fa fasting. Um, you know, fasting is one that, again, in the evangelical world, it was sort of like, yeah, do it if you like, you know, but there was no, um, there, there was nothing formalized again. There was nothing that guided you toward it or said, now, now you should do it. Yeah. Well, the practice, yeah. you know, the practices uh, bespeak the underlying theology. And I think uh, in some sense, there might've been uh, more of a kinship between Catholic spirituality and your background, Matt, in terms of, of seeing, um, like, why would we do these kind of practices? It's that we have a particular understanding, right? Of the of the journey of the Christian life in terms mm -hmm. of holiness and sanctification, talk a little bit about that. Again, the, some of the some of the the similarities and differences that you found uh, as a convert. Well, I feel like we should do a whole uh, on the journey episode about like how your <laughs> world and my world viewed celebration of discipline because it was yeah. hot. I mean, it was a hot item in a lot of pulpits uh, in the eighties mm -hmm. and nineties. Foster's book, and I'll tell you. I don't remember much about how celebration of discipline hit in other ways, but it was a gateway drug to a lot of pastors in my world talking about John of the Cross and specifically John of the Cross's Dark Night of the Soul. And I think it hit hard in the Wesleyan holiness movement because we were a revivalist movement, right? And so people are constantly backsliding and rededicating. And, you know, we got revival preachers coming through all the time and getting people to recommit and recommit and recommit. And so the question is, how's your walk, right? How's your walk? And if you don't, if you can't maintain that emotional consolation, is there something wrong with you? Well, John of the Cross has got the answer to that, right? John of the Cross mm -hmm. is one of the few people who's got the answer to that. I did not grow up thinking that John of the Cross, I thought it was like just some random dude's pen name. I didn't realize he was St. John of the Cross, doctor of the church and Carmelite priest, right? I did not understand that about him at all. Um, and, and we had some fasting mentions but there was never anything kind of formal taught about fasting there was a sense that you do got i mean this has got a you you got to live this stuff right you gotta mm -hmm. 
you know, purify your heart, purify your life. Um, if you want to conform yourself to Christ, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed, right? By the renewing of your minds. What's that look like? And, and there wasn't necessarily some formal spiritual discipline plan other than, you know, daily Bible reading, daily prayer and things like that. But I remember fasting was one of those things that was not, and this is something that was done in, in, uh, in my youth group. And I know it was like a national movement, this thing called the 40 hour famine. And, uh, we were supposed to, it was like, you know, in our case, it was a lock in, right? Where the youth group stays mm -hmm. in the, you know, yeah, the fellowship well, hall overnight and, and, uh, you fast, which is like, it was, it was murder on me because I'd never done anything like this before. And I had no idea it was, I'm here. I am like, you know, I just give me some Mountain Dew and pizza like right now. Um, and I think there was like some, some, uh, you know, almsgiving component to it. But I remember thinking and being really cynical about it at the time. Like, what's the point? Like, so I don't eat. What am I going to do? Like mail a pizza to Zimbabwe and that's going to fix it. Of course, it'll be rotten by the time it gets like, I didn't get it. I didn't get like how that conforms you to the mystical body of Christ. Like I was thinking purely in practical terms, like no food on my plate equals food on someone else's plate. And, mm -hmm. and so I didn't get that particular aspect of it. Uh, I do remember in college, there were a bunch of people who were trying to figure out this fasting thing because there was no, I mean, even in the Bible college I went to with all these people from all these random traditions, like there was a sense that it was important, but we didn't know like what's the protocols. And so I remember it may have even been during Lent. I don't recall, but a bunch of us decided we were going to fast. Mm. And I was like, well, what do we do for fast? Like, I don't know what to do. Like, how much can I eat? You know, how long should I do this for? And somebody's like, well, just don't eat anything. Just drink fruit juice. And, uh, and that's it. So I drank, I got like one of those big chugs of like apple juice. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> and, uh, one day <laughs> that was, that was my, uh, that was my deal. It was a very bad decision on my part for so many reasons. Um, but again, you, you know, when you don't have any kind of point of reference for fasting, I mean, I know right. that in the scriptures it says, you know, Jesus' apostles are having trouble casting out a demon. And he says, this kind only comes from, it comes out through prayer and fasting. And, and you, you want to know what that means. And what's fascinating is that on the other side, having become Catholic and sort of picked up, you know, this great rich tradition of spiritual disciplines and, and sort of the church giving you guidelines on how kinds of these kinds of things mm -hmm. can work and how like, you know, honestly, like some people need a spiritual director because they overdo it. Um, oh, yes. the church has got this stuff in place, but I remember going back to my grandmother's country Methodist church and they had a preacher, um, that I'd not met before and he's there and I'm visiting and um, he doesn't know I'm Catholic. Uh, he knows I went to Asbury, same as him. And he gets up there and he gives a sermon on fasting. I've never heard a sermon on fasting in any Protestant church that I was ever in in my whole life. And so afterwards I was like, I got to talk to this guy. I mean, there's only like 25 people at church. So it's not a hard thing for me to get in the line, talk to the preacher. But I was like, uh, you know, Pastor, I just want to say how much I appreciate you bringing up the subject of fasting. I, I never heard it talked about growing up in any of the churches I ever went to. And he's like, well, to be honest, I was a little nervous about talking about fasting in in, in this Methodist church. Uh, I was afraid people would think I was too. And I was like, wait, is he going to say Catholic? And he's like, <laughs> too, too Pentecostal. I'm like, oh, oh. That's the other tradition that really puts a high value on fasting is Pentecostalism, right? And that wasn't part of my tradition either, but Pentecostals very much. And Paul Thigpen would be the perfect person to talk about this. Yeah. Um, but or that Kenny idea charged, of, yeah. or Kenny, right, um, that fasting <laughs> really is, you know, you want to be led by the Spirit, you got to give up all the stuff that's in the way. And Pentecostals, right. you know, have that in their tradition. I just, I did not. You know, you, you made a good point I was going to bring up, which is that even uh, if you so the, the Catholic Church does give us some great guidelines and these great opportunities, invitations to practice the spiritual disciplines. That doesn't mean that Catholics do it very well. I think um, Catholics are, many of us are, well, we're still trying to figure this out after a long time of how to really to fast well. You know, and we too go back to uh, Christ's words in, in the Gospel of Matthew and realize, oh gosh, like I don't do this very well. We just finished up a series with Denise Bossert talking about redemptive suffering. Uh, and it's it's good to talk about that in connection with fasting, because it's like the point there is that you're going to suffer. And when you do, you're wrestling with this profound mystery, this profound opportunity to be united with Christ. But fasting is kind of what you do uh, in the in the good times, right? When the, the suffering hasn't quite come for you yet, but you need to be getting ready for it. Well, we ourselves can, can uh, voluntarily give up some good, some good thing. We can make mm -hmm. a sacrifice of it. 
uh, to begin to practice this because the point is is that we're we're allowing we're not doing something of our own strength we're not falling into the the works righteousness that sometimes Catholics are accused of we're we're leaning on our weakness here we're we're, we're recognizing our attached uh, our attachment and voluntarily offering something up as an opportunity to go closer to Christ. One yeah. way to think of the spiritual disciplines, you know, you're right. It, it, it's not a, a damning system of works righteousness, you know, as some Protestants think that Catholicism is. But, but our goal, uh, our goal ought to be in life to get to draw closer to the Lord, so we can hear His voice, and we can conform our lives to Him. What He loves, we we love. What He we see him doing, we do. And in a way, the, the spiritual di- disciplines are ways of various ways of separating ourselves from the distractions. So the spiritual discipline of silence, you know, you're separating yourself for a time away from all the sounds of other people's voices and your own voice so that you could hear the Lord. The, di- the discipline of solitude, you're separating yourself from other people so that you could be with the Lord. Um, the discipline of of study, of course, is not a, I mean, it's a separation from the other subjects, I guess, to focus directly on that, just as prayer is a separation. Um, and fasting is, we're separating ourselves from something that is a good, a created good, and something we need to remind ourselves that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So, I mean, all these are ways of separating ourselves from good. In fact, giving away, almsgiving, you're separating yourselves from your treasure. All of this is separating in a way to try and put you with the Lord. And and it's hard to do. In the spiritual tradition within Catholicism that I'm associated with, um, I'm my plan of life includes 30 minutes of mental prayer in the morning and in the afternoon. So that's one full hour a day in which I'm supposed to just literally sit down in a chair and close my eyes and talk to God. Talk to the Lord, listen to the Lord, D- describe to him the things I'm doing, the things I'm struggling with, the people I love, what, the, what they're going through. And for a guy like me, that is hard, one hour, because my body just wants to jump out of the chair and start moving around. And In fact, often I do, and I'm told that's okay, like to go ma- make a bed or vacuum a floor while you're doing it and all that. But, 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 but that's what the spiritual disciplines are. They're ways of getting me with God and getting me away from all the other things things in life. And that's something any Protestant can do too. I would I would never say to any of the people who come to us in the Coming Home Network who are maybe just at some point along the way of interest in the Catholic Church, I would never say, oh, well, until you become a Catholic, you don't have anything. No, you, you've you got all of this and you can do it too. And I, I guess I speaking right here, I want to encourage anybody listening that it doesn't matter. You're a Baptist, non-denominational, you're a, a Methodist, you're a, a, an Anglican, Lutheran, whatever you are, these things apply to you too, because you're you're trying to follow the Lord too. Yeah, what's fascinating to me in in all this is is how many. I mean, it's a it's a very different world now than it was in the mid '80s. You know, when very a great many evangelical Catholic Christians were not sure that Catholics were even Christian too. I feel like we've come a long way, and I think there are a lot of people that can be credited with mm-hmm. with helping that, including people like Chuck Colson, a evangelical Protestant who had good friendships with a lot of Catholics and made it look like it was okay, right? And uh, mm-hmm. yeah. took out took out some of the scary factor for a lot of people, um, at least at sort of the the higher levels. But I think as one of the pieces of fruit from that that has that has come forth is that. I got a lot of friends who are Methodist pastors now who I went to college with. They do Ash Wednesday. They do Ash Wednesday mm-hmm. services. Um, I know people who are Protestant but do ecumenical stations of the cross type of services. Right. Um, I know, uh, people who do, I, I don't remember much in the way of Good Friday, like formal services, but now it feels like everybody I know who's a Protestant pastor ha- is doing something. Right. Mm-hmm. In, in that regard. And I hear more and more about fasting. I hear more and more about, you know, people reading into the wisdom of of even like the Desert Fathers. Uh, right. Um, I, I feel like this is this is something that it, the doors are more open uh, for people to kind of tap into that ancient wisdom than they ever were before. I mean, I know people who are just like you, Ken, and you've shared this recently and on the journey, who they're pastors. But, you know, in some Protestant tradition, Baptist, Methodist or otherwise, and they still go out to the monastery every once in a while to pray for a couple of days. <laughs> you know, I feel like these things are there's there's a lot more of an open door to 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 really 
discuss and experience yeah, and think, these things than there ever was before. And I think there are two reasons for, for that, at least two, but two that come to mind. One is this, that as Protestantism continues to disintegrate because standing upon scripture alone, people disagree and they have to form new denominations. New Well, th- as there's this sort of dis- disintegration, there's a yearning in many hearts for to get back to history, to get back to but what is what is authentic historical Christianity. I feel like I'm out there on this little twig now. You know, I'm part of a, a group that didn't exist until five years ago. And so there's a desire to get back. But also I think that there's just the natural yearning of the human heart because we are created beings. And I, I remember early on reading uh, Thomas Howard's book, Evangelical is Not Enough, where while he was still an evangelical, he was coming to believe that that because God created us as embodied souls that and and a part of creation, that the idea that somehow the worship of God needs to be purely intellectual or mental, that there was something wrong with it. Now, after the Reformation, there were the most, more extreme forms within some of the Calvinist lines where, you know, tear out the altars, smash the all the statues, get rid of the stained glass windows, paint your church pure white, Make sure there's no image or picture of any kind, you know, a, a real strong overreaction. And they would view it as, oh, you have a crucifix, you want to look at something, that's carnal, that's sensual, that's that's your body. The worship of God must be pure spirit, meaning mental, prayer to God, studying the Bible. Or you want to have a statue, you want to have a stained glass window, oh, oh man, you want to have incense burning so you can smell something. All that is viewed as being sensual, you know, carnal fleshly. And yet, as I was coming toward Catholicism, I, I remember the illustration coming to me one day, I thought, so that means if I'm sitting out on the beach here in Southern California, and I see this gorgeous sunset over the ocean or the Pacific Ocean, and the sky is just lit up with pink and orange and gold and all this going down, and if I lift up my soul and to, to thank God for what I'm looking at, then my evangelical friend ought to slap me on the side of the head and say, stop that, Ken, that's sensual. <laughs> God, God is to be worshipped. God right. is to be worshipped in spirit and, and in truth. But anyway, it, it was that realization that no, God's creation is good. I'm a created being. If I thank God for a beautiful sunset, that is something good. And therefore, guess what? Having candles, having incense, having stained glass windows, all these things are good. All these things yeah. help. All these things fit with our essential nature as embodied souls that um that again makes me enjoy what 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 we do at um at, in Holy Week. It makes you sense of something like fasting in a very, you know, simple way. Like, well, maybe God came to save my body and my soul. So maybe my body has something to do in the course of this as well. Right. Yeah, I was I, I love what you talked about there, the the sunset can because even if you think about the liturgical seasons that the church invites us to participate in they are positioned strategically in the year precisely to help use our senses to draw us into them mm-hmm. i love for instance in advent that preparation time before christmas it's on this time we're just just naturally by the state of the year it's coming out of the harvest season it's cold but it's sort of cozy that kind of a year lent comes the time of the year where it's cold and damp and rainy and just like you're tired of winter you're just like can winter please just be done and then of course easter corresponds with spring mm-hmm. hopefully finally springing and we have we have nature bespeaking uh, the meaning of the celebration that we're having. But I wanted to talk, you know, uh, a couple more things here. We, we, I know we want to wrap it up pretty soon. Okay. Um, but t- let's talk a little bit, two things about the, se- uh, we want to, of course, uh, propose and invite people to consider that uh, uh, in addition to above, uh, as a fulfillment of what you already have, we do think Catholicism offers you something very beautiful. Um, but, but, um, uh, and so we want to talk about that. We also want to encourage people, again, wherever they are in the journey, to to engage in this season uh, wherever they are. But talk for a moment about the sacraments. I mean, the whole Holy Week, talk about the, having the Eucharist now as a Catholic to really crown and really bring Holy Week all the way to fruition at, as um, as Christ really does come mm-hmm. in <laughs> in the body to encounter us. Talk about that for a moment, if you would, Matt. All right, so I would love to talk about that because— this is the piece that was missing uh, for me, right? When it came to the Monday Thursday, like I always knew that communion was something special. I always knew that when St. Paul said that it was a bad thing to receive it unworthily, that he really did mean that. I just didn't know what he meant by that. 
And I always wanted to pray and ask God to forgive my sins privately before I received communion. And I wanted to try and make sure that I was mentally dialed into the situation. But but still, I, it was hard to like kind of understand why it meant so much. Like, why this? Like, what's what's going on? And when you go to a Holy Thursday, I mean, if you're not Catholic, go to a Holy Thursday service and you'll understand at least a little bit of where we're coming from because it gets into the whole reality and mystery because at the last supper jesus gives the church gives his his body right he says this is my body as saint augustine says since he said this is my body who is to doubt that it is his body it might actually might have been saint cyril that said that but either way like this is (laughs) he, he says it pretty straightforward the same person uh, you know, who's part of the Trinity that said, let there be light and light happened is now saying, this is my body. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's not the only sacrament that's happening there that night. Uh, the Catholic Church understands that as the institution of the priesthood, because not only is Jesus giving the church a sacrament, he's giving the church an order of priests mm-hmm. to preside over that sacrament. Um, and he begins it all by washing their feet. I mean, it's a powerful, powerful thing to witness. I had a um, a pastor for a number of years who every year on Holy Thursday, uh, at the end, he would get up, and he was not a touchy-feely guy, and he was not a person who necessarily showed a whole lot of emotion, but uh, he you know, basically drew a line in the sand every year on Holy Thursday, and he's like, I am going to, before this entire congregation... Uh, you know, renew my priestly vows that I took when I was ordained. <laughs> like, because that's the... That's the night when the church recognizes that Jesus instituted the priesthood. And then he stood up there, you know, got choked up doing it every year because that's that's a mystery. I mean, Jesus, when you really kind of enter into that and then you see the altar stripped, right? And then you see the blessed sacrament, which we as Catholics believe is body, blood, soul, and divinity, Jesus Christ, moved off of the main altar, moved out of the main tabernacle, moved off to the side, or moved in some cases into another building. And people go into that other building or that other chapel, and they do what the apostles couldn't do, which is wait one hour with Christ in Eucharistic adoration. The whole thing just comes together in in a way that that I it, it's it was the missing thing. Like I knew it was all important. I knew the crucifixion mattered. I knew the resurrection mattered. I didn't know why Holy Thursday mattered. And as a Catholic, I'm just so grateful that all those pieces are put together uh, in that way. Beautiful, Matt. Any thoughts on that one, Ken? The sacraments in terms of your your practice now of the the Lent and Holy Week? Yeah. What I'm thinking, I I, I see like three concentric circles in in my mind. What we've been talking, or what I've been talking about so far, is the the beauty simply of the, the formalization of a structure that the church provides for us with Lent and then Holy Week and all that. A second, you know, and just the beauty of that, because we are the kind of people who need things like that and because we're created beings and so all of this is good. It's good for us. Um, But then there's another concentric circle, which would be the sacramentals, which I rejected totally as an evangelical. But now to walk into the church and to dip my finger into into the water, now that we have water again after COVID, and cross myself and be reminded of my baptism, you know, and Jesus washed away my sins. I'm walking into the church now. What I do, I do in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is is beautiful. And then the priest on on um, on Easter morning or at the Easter vigil, walking through the congregation and hitting us with holy water. You know, it's the sacramentals too that are beautiful, and they're meaningful. If you make them meaningful, you, you you know, someone could say, oh, it's just ritual. It's not meaningful. Well, okay, then take off your wedding ring and throw it away. It's not, it's not meaningful. It's just ritual. Quit shaking hands with someone when you meet them. It's just, it's just, it's not meaningful. It's ritual. Well, rituals are good and the sacramentals are good. And then the inner circle though is the sacraments, which I didn't have. Yeah, I, I didn't have before. Uh, all I had was symbolic actions. And so to me, and I, I'll bounce off what you said about about Monday Thursday and good which was the um the last supper yeah when when Jesus sits there with his apostles and he washes their feet and he says you don't understand what I'm doing now but you will understand and and we, and we look at that as Catholics now and we say he's ordaining them he's he, he's ordaining them into the priesthood and it but but it's not just that one action because then he breaks the bread and he he, he and he shares the cup and he says 
this is the blood of the new covenant. And he is quoting almost verbatim the very words that Moses spoke when the, when the old covenant was being instituted in Exodus chapter 24, when Moses said, this is, he killed the animals and he said, and he sprinkled the blood. He said, this is the blood of the covenant. So Moses institutes the old covenant. Jesus sitting there now at a Passover meal, which is a sacrificial meal, the Passover lamb having been slaughtered. It's a sacrificial meal. The context is sacrifice and him being the priest after the order of Melchizedek, our great high priest. So this priest sits at a table and he picks up the, the, he, he, put, he picks up the elements that have been sacrificed that are being offered to God. And he says, this is the blood of the new covenant. And then he says, then he says to those with him, do this in memory of me. And many biblical scholars have said that, that even the, even the verb do this harkens back to the old Testament where they would, where the Levitical priests were told, here's a certain kind of offering, do this offering, do this sacrifice, the same kind of verb being used that what he's, he's not just saying, do this. He's saying, offer this. When, right. when you do this, you're, you're, you're going to do what I'm doing. You're going to offer this as a memorial offering. As you know, in the old Testament, there were memorial offerings. He's ordaining them as priests and he's instituting something that they are going to do in memory of, uh, of him, they're going to offer the same sacrifice that he has offered again and again. And then that passage in John 20, he breathes on them and he says, receive the Holy Spirit who, who's ever, whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Who in the Old Testament offered sacrifice? The priests. Who in the Old Testament forgave sins? The priests. You would, you would bring your sacrifice the priest would offer the sacrifice. You would tell the priest your sin and you would be forgiven. Well, you know, all of this is happening on that Thursday night. And when, when we commemorate that in the church and 12 men sit there and their, their feet are washed and then we, you know, the whole thing, that's what we're commemorating. And yeah. that, that was something I had no, I had no clue to when I, when I was a Baptist. And so confession during that time, during the time of Lent and leading up and confession the week of Holy Week yeah. as well. And then the sacrament of the Eucharist just takes us to that, to the, to the inner sanctum of God. Yeah. I, yeah you know, that reality uh, for us as Christians, that that's the proposal here that when Christ said that I will remain with you, that we, we aren't the Christians who got unlucky. Like we came after Christ was on this earth. And so now we just kind of get to, to memorialize it. no, by this new priesthood and by these new mm -hmm. sacraments, he creates these permanent and everlasting uh, points in time and space where we can know with certainty that Christ is there. Christ, we, we can come in contact with him like, like they did. Um, we, of course, can and should, as soon as we have fallen short, as soon as we have sinned, we go to God and we repent and we say that we're sorry and we trust that something already is happening there in terms of God's grace working on us. But how do I know that I'm sorry? And how do I know that I have encountered Christ and received that forgiveness? Well, I have the, the sacraments as this place I can go. And again, that priest isn't there representing himself or his own power or authority. He is in persona Christi. Christ uses him as this place where I can come in contact with Christ. And so we, again, we have this permanent visible sign of a spiritual reality mm -hmm. where we know God shows up. And that's, you know, so in terms of Holy Week with Easter, like to have that whole thing as a spiritual discipline, but to also have the sacraments as a part of that, the confession and the Eucharist is a, just an amazing thing. Amen. Well, gentlemen, I appreciate, I appreciate your thoughts here. I mean, I guess as a final word, we just want to encourage, right, And wherever a person listening or watching might be, a member of the Coming Home Network, or maybe somebody who's not yet a member of the network, wherever you are on your spiritual journey, we'd like to invite you to enter into this time, this Lenten time. It's just about over, this Lenten time, and now this Holy Week. Celebrate with us. Pray with us. Um, I mean, the key is that we remain close to Christ. We keep journeying with him, and he'll, he'll lead us into unity. He'll repair the body uh, in his own good time and providence. And any final words of encouragement you gentlemen want to offer them? Ken or Matt? I would just say, uh, if you are a Protestant who has, you know, been watching some of these videos on the sly, uh, sneak into one of the Triduum services. Sneak into one of the extra services that's available uh, in your Catholic church during Holy Week. Um, and just see, just just witness. Maybe Holy Thursday, you've got something going on at your own parish or your own church. You know, then maybe sneak in, you know, on Good Friday. Or maybe even just try some of the stuff that uh, 
the church recommends for Good Friday. Like, just practice complete silence between noon and three on Friday. Or just one of the things, uh, you know, that maybe is, you know, one of the Catholic things, <laughs> right? Uh, maybe just see, see what that's like. Uh, or go to an Easter vigil. That's Saturday night. Uh, and just just sit by and witness while there's a bonfire in the entire Bible, right? Uh, just just check it out. See, just see what you think. It's a it's a neat thing, and uh, you could just come as a as a spectator and and pray with us. Very good. Any thoughts, Ken? Did you say there's a bonfire in the in the entire Bible? No, and and oh 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 okay <laughs> so. okay okay. Um, you know what? I don't know. We if don't I have anything. We don't burn Bibles during Holy Week. No, we no, please, no, we please don't. Don't. <laughs> But we have bonfires. Yeah, and yes. we all light candles and we carry them into the church. It's a beautiful I- I thing. So, you know, I, I feel like I'm, I'm just going to piggyback on what Matt said. I, I think that it would be a great experience just to go to a Catholic church for Easter vigil and just sit and watch what happens. I, I remember the first time I even went into a Catholic church um, when I was on the journey. I was probably about two-thirds of the way along and I'd never been into one. And I pulled up in front of a Hispanic Catholic church in a, well, where I live is mainly Hispanic. It was, it was so I, and I was afraid. I remember I got out of the car and I thought, man, this is like weird. Felt like walking through, you know, like the doors of a Masonic hall or, or something strange, you know, go mm-hmm. like walk into a Mormon, you know, it just felt like kind of frightening. And I went inside and I remember looking around and remarking at, at how pretty it was. You know, it's all pastel painted, a lot of color and everything. And there were statues and all these things. But I was afraid. I remember sitting there just quietly and thinking, man, a priest is going to walk in here and he's going to look at me and he's just going to know that I am an interloper. I do not belong. He's going to point across the room. You, you know, get out. What are you doing here? And so it can be kind of frightening to some people. But you know what? If you go down to a Catholic church on the on the evening of Easter vigil, you'll be able to just go with the crowd inside and j- just watch and tell us what you find. Tell us what you hear. Yeah, definitely tell us what you what you find in here. Uh, we want to reiterate that point that uh, we're always here for you. You know, whatever stage of the journey again you happen to be, the Coming Home Network is your network here. I want to thank you, gentlemen, for joining me for this episode of Deep in Christ. I appreciate your thoughts mm-hmm. and reflections. And thank you, uh, watcher or listener, for joining us for this episode. As I said, the Coming Home Network, uh, check it out, chnetwork.org. A lot of resources and videos and, and articles there that you can check out. But uh, most importantly, and poignantly for this particular episode is our community, community community.chnetwork.org. Again, there's a whole bunch of people in there just like you, men and women on the journey from all different backgrounds who are considering uh, the church, who are considering her sacraments, who are considering her teachings. Um, But we're all patient there. We recognize that we're all on a journey and the daily task remains the same just to keep walking with Jesus mm-hmm. today. So if, if you're interested in that, if that seems like a community you'd like to be part of, we'd welcome you in there. We'd love to hear how your Holy Week and Easter went this year. So God bless you. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of Deep in Christ. God bless. Mm-hmm.